I think it's safe to say the last several years have been good for Larian. Baldur's Gate 3 was a surprise smash hit sequel to a genre-defining game more than 20 years after the fact, and it won so many awards that I think it's an easy contender for one of the greatest RPGs of all time. Go back several years and you have Divinity Original Sin 2, another surprise smash hit that arguably put Larian on the map in the modern day. Naturally, we're not talking about either of those. Divinity 2 launched for the first time on November 20th, 2009 to mixed reviews. And while its more completed re-release two years later did a lot better, the game has been so overshadowed by later games that it isn't even the first thing that pops up when you try searching for it. For all intents and purposes, this seems to be a game that's been forgotten by gaming at large. I never forgot it though, so today we're going to take a close look at the second strangest game in Larian's catalog. Rather than the CRPGs that Larian is known for, Divinity 2 is a third-person action RPG, closer to something like Two Worlds 2 than the game it's actually a sequel to. It puts the player in the shoes of a brand new dragon slayer, fresh from the academy and on their way to the initiation ritual that will properly induct them into the organization. The first stop is the town of Farglow, so we can learn the ropes, but first we have to make a character. The character customization is very limited, especially for an RPG. There are only a few options for your face and your voice, and your hair color is actually restricted by your gender. Fortunately, I never put too much thought into my characters, and once I settle on a voice and a shade of brown, we can get started. Farglow is a sleepy little town in the mountains that serves as our tutorial. After getting the ability to see the spirits of the dead, we're offered our choice between the tried and true combat styles for a game like this. Melee for when you want to hit things, ranged for when you want the game to be a cakewalk, and my personal favorite, magic. The town has a few weak enemies for you to practice on, and you can switch freely between all three until you leave the town. Here we're also introduced into what I would consider the coolest mechanic in the game, mind reading. When you speak to most NPCs, you have the option to go into a bit of an experience debt to read their surface thoughts. This allows you to learn information that they wouldn't normally tell you, or it can just provide some fun flavor details, both of which the game demonstrates very early. When you're first given the power, you have the option to read the mind of the person who gave it to you. You don't get anything for it, but her response does tell you that mind reading is something that dragon slayers not only try on each other, but some of them are better at defending against it than others. Before you leave the town, if you read Edmund's mind, you learn the location of the key to his personal chest. It contains a couple useful items, but it's a nice reward for your curiosity, and also a way for the game to reinforce that mind reading the people that you meet is a good idea. You do want to be careful with it, though. The experience cost can get very steep, especially in the last area of the game, so you want to be careful who you decide to mind read. As a general rule of thumb, the more expensive it is, the better the reward you can expect. After you leave Far Glow, the group takes a detour to the region of Broken Valley, where reports indicate the last Dragon Knight has been sighted. Since finishing the Order's entire mission is more important than finishing your initiation, you're turned loose on the village to see if you can scrounge up some info. Broken Valley quickly establishes the pattern that nearly every area in this game will follow. The village is where you pick up all of your quests, and then for most of them you'll need to travel outside the village to find the thing or kill the enemy that you need to. And once you do that, you return to the quest giver to get your reward. So far, so standard for the genre. Though Divinity 2 does go the extra mile and gives you multiple ways to solve some of the quests. Besides the obvious way to solve things, the game rewards you for digging a little deeper. Ask around, snoop through someone's diary, or mind read the right person, and you can suddenly find yourself deciding that actually you don't want to help the quest giver after all. This is also where the game starts to lean most into the R in RPG. As an example, when you're asked to deliver an obvious love letter to the town blacksmith, do you do it? That's the person who's going to be providing you gear for the early parts of the game, after all, and I'm sure he'd be grateful. Do you tell the woman's husband instead? Well, no, because if you dig a little deeper, you find out the man's actually a murderer. You can even turn him over to the guard and leave his farm more or less deserted. Even in the dialogue, you have a chance to define who your character is. Is your dragon slayer petty enough to taunt the half-dragon with the name of the master he could never live up to? I know mine always is. While the game doesn't have branching paths in the story, there are a lot of small ways to express yourself and how you tackle the side content. Aside from the questing, the thing you spend the most time doing in Divinity 2 is combat. It's the kind of action combat that was fairly popular when the game came out, but we don't seem to get as often anymore. You have your standard weapon attacks and a hotbar you can assign some abilities and consumables to. Or if you're a mage, you ignore the weapon and just spam your spells instead. When enemies get too close or decide to use 
use one of the handful of area attacks in the game, you have a dodge roll that gives you limited iframes, and a jump that eventually turns into the world's greatest backflip. And when you kill an enemy, you get a certain amount of experience, based on the difference between your level and theirs. In the initial release of the game, there was also an armor and damage bonus if your level was higher, and the enemies got it too. Fortunately, that version isn't available unless you manage to track it down at a secondhand store, and in the easily available versions of the game, that system's been more or less removed. The first dozen or so fights in every area are going to be fairly challenging for you because the enemies are a higher level, but after a couple combats you'll level up pretty quickly and things will even out, and by the end of your time in an area you'll just start blowing through fight after fight. Each level up gives you a few attribute points to spend across the usual suspects. Typically, you want to put a few points into your health and mana, with the majority of them going into whichever stat ties into your chosen build. You also get a skill point, which is where you can really define what your character can do in combat. Skills are spread across four different categories that cover the broad character archetypes, though there aren't proper classes in the game. If you're playing a sword and board melee character and decide that maybe the charm spell would help make fights easier, there's nothing stopping you from picking it up. Each of the four major archetypes start pretty weak, but scale quickly to the point where at least three of them allow you to really break combat by the end of the game. The only one I've never tried is the Priest build, which is more of a support and summon focused mage, but honestly I'm sure it gets just as strong as everything else. As an example, by the end of the game the magic missile spell fires five bolts that hit for several hundred damage each, and the fireball spell starts hitting for three or four thousand damage. Most enemies, even at that point, have only a about 2,500 health, so everything that's not a boss becomes pretty trivial. Of course, the enemies have access to the same skills you do, and they give as good as they get. Each style of combat has one or two abilities that can take you out of the fight for several seconds if you're not careful, and an enemy at your level can kill you very quickly if they have an opening. While it can be frustrating at times, the high lethality of the combat keeps most fights short and engaging. To keep yourself from dying, the game gives you access to a wide variety of color-coded gear. It follows a a fairly standard color scheme for this kind of game, with the gray gear being the weakest and the gold set gear usually being the strongest. It also features a crafting system, though the way it works is kind of strange. Rather than crafting anything yourself, you take the reagents you harvest during your travels to one of the specialists scattered around the world, and they'll do it for you. For the first part of the game, you need to find them around Broken Valley, which I actually did miss my first two times that I played it. The alchemist is especially important to find because that's who crafts the the potions that are your main source of healing, unless you specifically invest in the healing spell. Around a third of the way through the game, you gain access to a place called the Battle Tower, which makes the whole process easier as every specialist you need is located there, in spots you can just teleport to. They can also be upgraded by carrying out some quests for them that gives them some extra utility. The Battle Tower is also the point in the game where you unlock what is probably the most iconic thing, turning into a dragon. An hour or two into Broken Valley, you find out that the other dragon slayers only nearly succeeded in living up to their title, and the last dragon knight passes her powers on to you. From that point, the game waits several hours before giving you the item you need to actually take dragon form. On the writing side of things, it's actually handled very well. Making you wait for so long into the game while building up the importance of turning into a dragon lends some real anticipation for when that actually happens. The gameplay side is very underwhelming, if I'm being honest. Your dragon form handles great. It has the ability to hover in place when you're not pushing a direction, can easily strafe, and can turn on a dime when you need to. The issue is that there are exactly three threats between the towers, spawners, and these little flying enemies that can all be solved with a flamethrower. The actual content for the dragon form is also spread very unevenly through the game. Aside from the brief introduction when you first get the ability, there's one major area, some optional flying challenges, and a single escort mission right at the end of the game that is, unironically, probably the best part of the dragon gameplay. As for those optional dragon challenges, or the flying fortresses to use their proper name, they're probably the weakest part of the game. You first run into them about halfway through the game when you've gotten your dragon form and a shopping list of items that you can tackle in any order. Each of them consists of a series of 
floating islands packed with high-level enemies. The islands are bristling with defenses and these anti-dragon zones, which kill you if you fly too far through them. Generally, the approach to these is to transform into your dragon form as soon as you can, clear out as many of the towers and enemies as possible, and then land near anything that looks like a teleporter, so you can fight the fortress's boss. While they aren't required for the story, it's a good idea to clear them because they do give you a lot of experience, and it'll help make sure you're properly leveled for the fight. Also, depending on the version you play, they'll even have some or all of the best gear you can get before the second part of the game, so I do recommend tackling them. Like most Larian games I've played, the story of Divinity 2 is very dense at the start and at the end, and sparse in the middle. After the village section of Broken Valley, you disobey a direct order and run into Talana, the last of the Dragon Knights. She uses her dying breath to make you the new last Dragon Knight and passes along her mission, to find the path to the Hall of Echoes to resurrect Yagerna. Now I'm going to assume you're not familiar with the lore of the Divinity series, so I'll try to provide some background. Damien here is basically a demon in a human body, and he's out to conquer the world. His adopted father killed his girlfriend because she was an evil cultist, and at the moment of her death, Damien cast a spell that normally makes it so that when one person dies, the other does too. But seeing as Yagerna was already dead, it didn't really function as everyone expected it to, and because of this, the wizard Xandalore wants us to bring Yagerna back because he's pretty sure that will kill Damien for good. Most of the game is your journey to do just that, so rather Rather than do an in-depth look at the plot, I'll instead just talk about each individual area and highlight my favorite quests from each. I will have to spoil some things, so if you're interested in playing the game and want to avoid that, you can skip to the timestamp on screen. Broken Valley is an area that I feel perfectly exemplifies Larian's approach to RPGs. Your objective is the large tower at the center that dominates the landscape and your view almost no matter where you are in the valley. You can head there immediately, and Talana, who's now a voice in your head, will react to almost anything you do by urging you to go there now. But if you rush the main plot and don't explore the surrounding area, you miss so much. Having to stop and smell the proverbial roses won't be a surprise to anyone who's played much Baldur's Gate 3 or the original Sin games, but if you're not used to that approach then it can be a tough habit to learn. The ring that runs around the tower is densely packed with quests, encounters, and dungeons. A random goblin village that you can completely skip past hides a series of tunnels that themselves hide an unmarked puzzle for a powerful amulet, for example. At certain shrines scattered throughout the valley you can run into Belagar, the mad mage who uses his incredible magical power to basically run a prank YouTube channel. Following the critical path, you'll run into him at least once, but to see his quest line to completion, you actually have to hunt around. Of course, my personal favorite quest here is something that's so easy to miss, I actually did the first couple times I played the game. The commander of the village guard wants you to break a bandit out of prison with the intention of learning the location and the passcode to their camp. Getting that is easy enough, but if you don't turn that quest in right away, you can actually visit the camp. The first quest you find there is helping two bandits escape that way of life so that they can raise their new family on the right side of the law. And that's just a nice little extra reward for the people who thought to check the place out first. The attack on the camp later, which ends with an Indiana Jones-style dungeon crawl through an ancient temple, is the highlight of the area for me, though. Just. Don't ask me how to get this chest. Sentinel Island is roughly about the halfway point of the Ego Draconis part of this game. The main quest here is actually pretty interesting. Your overarching goal is to reclaim the Battle Tower from the Necromancer Lycan, something that even the island wants to see you do. To that end, it's kidnapped roughly a dozen people to serve you as Master of the Tower, but you need to whittle that number down a bit. Each of the options for the various positions has their own backstory and motivations that the game wants you to consider, and there are no wrong choices. Or, at least there aren't from a narrative standpoint. Mechanically, each of the options works better with different builds, so you'll usually find your choices set based on whatever it is you're trying to do. This part of the game also introduces Sassen, who, while not a major presence for the rest of the game after this, is a very fun character in the time she's given. I live again, Lycan! You corpse-defiling wretch! 
Her undead doppelganger that you run into a number of times is also very fun, but only because of the absolutely savage lines they give you if you're feeling snarky. Once you've reclaimed the tower and the dragonstone, it's time to open the path to the Hall of Echoes, which means that it's time for the Ouroboros Fjords. This area is really where the dragon gameplay comes into its own, as the whole region is dominated by cliffs that don't always have footpaths. Like Broken Valley, it's incredibly dense on the quest front. You also get more quality Belagar content, and who doesn't love that? While there's a lot to like about the area, there are two quests in particular that stand out for me personally. One is serious, and the other is very, very silly. By this point in the game, you've killed so many goblins that they've come to recognize you on site, and after clearing out most of the largest camp in the game, one of them finally stops to talk to you. A goblin beholder asks that you find them a scribe that can translate from the goblin language. They want the tribe's stories, which are handed down orally from generation to generation, to be preserved even if the rest of the tribe is wiped out. It's a very somber moment, and while the rewards aren't exceptional, I do make sure to do it on every playthrough. Clear on the other side of the map, though, is a quest that's the tonal opposite of everything we just did. In the ruined citadel of the Dragon Knight Ouroboros, a group of worshippers have been waiting for your arrival, so you can free their lord from the vault he locked himself in when the Dragon Slayers came for him. Inside, you find his skeleton as he succumbed to the wounds that he received in the battle. After speaking with a very questionable chest, you leave the vault only for some of those worshippers to reveal themselves as, well, I better let them explain it. Tybus! Mark them! Tobolus! Rethar! Plet! No joke, this is easily one of the hardest fights in the game. It's also a great example of Larian's trademark brand of humor, which has been a constant in just about every game they've made. The least fleshed out area, at least in the Ego Draconis portion of the game, is the city of Alaroth. By the time you reach the city, it's already being besieged by Damien's forces. You can't explore much of it the first time you visit. Instead, the whole thing is relegated to a wave defense segment, where you protect Xandalore from enemies who are pretty keen on ignoring you. That wouldn't be such a bad thing, except every time they manage to land a hit on him, the timer restarts. There's not much to say regarding strategy here, just keep smacking the enemies as they spawn, and eventually you'll get through it. After you have everything you need, it's off to the Hall of Echoes to finish up this part of the game. The Hall serves as an afterlife for the setting of Divinity, where the souls of the dead have their memories stripped away before they can be returned to the world to reincarnate. Since you come here while still alive, though, the whole place has it out for you. There are some new enemies here in the Memory Eaters, alongside a refight with every major enemy that you fought during the game, which I think qualifies this as part of the Mega Man series. Each fight starts with a conversation, which is a nice touch to help flesh these characters out more, though most of them boil down to them being upset you killed them and looking to return the favor. There's a bit of awkwardness depending on the order in which you did things, where certain bosses will talk about how they've been dreaming of revenge when you last saw them about ten minutes ago. Once the fights are done, it's off to the final battle in the memory of Yagurna's death. This is brutal as far as final battles go. You face off against several high-level fighters split across every combat style. Every trick and every ability in the game gets thrown at you here, and being just a little unlucky can spell disaster. Playing this as a mage, I have to resort to running circles around the outside of the room, chugging potions and firing off spells when I have room to breathe. This battle is why you really want to make sure your levels and your gear are up to par. A lesson I learned the hard way on my very first playthrough. The original release of the Ego Draconis part of the game was very buggy, and I found myself stuck on this fight, because I'd gotten this far only being level 27. After about a dozen tries, one of the warriors knocked me out of bounds, where I could hit the enemies with my spells, but none of them could hit me. Twenty minutes of casting later, I squeaked through the fight with probably the most luck I've ever had in a video game. Once you do beat the fight, the game reveals the big twist, which is one I actually really like. The voice you've been hearing in your head all game is not Talana. Talana is dead. You've been hearing Yagerna's voice the whole time. Resurrecting her won't kill Damien. It'll make him immortal as long as Yagerna lives. And you've just trapped yourself in the Hall of Echoes for nothing. Game over, you lose. 
for now at least. Now, I do see how somebody might have an issue with the Soulforge part of things, but seeing as it's the kind of magic that no even passably sane mage would use, and even the most knowledgeable wizard in the game doesn't really know how it works, I'm willing to accept it. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. Released originally as a standalone expansion, a year after Ego Draconis, Flames of Vengeance picks up right where this story leaves off and properly wraps things up. Because it released as a separate game first, the versions of Divinity 2 that are easily available allow you to start a fresh character from that part of the game. Character creation works much the same as it did at the start, and I'm still wondering why female characters have so many more options for their hair color, though you start at level 35. They have handy preset builds for each of the four archetypes, but you can also do everything manually if you want to try something different. The plot hits the ground running once you finish character creation. With Damien's forces bolstered by Yagerna's success, Zandalore turned to some ancient magic to hold them back. Specifically, he found a strange shield spell that he borrowed the top layer of, and in doing so woke up the necromancer that spell is keeping bound. Said necromancer seeks you out and offers you a deal. Set him free and he'll give you a weapon to defeat Damien, and also bring the Divine back to life. The Divine being Damien's adopted father and the protagonist of the first Divinity game. He's kind of a big deal. It's clearly a bad deal, but you're desperate to get back in the fight. The Necromancer stops just shy of a maniacal laugh and sends you back the only way he could. And so starts what is honestly my favorite part of the game. Flames of Vengeance is a fairly radical shift in scope and tone from the rest of the game. Instead of the standard high fantasy adventure, this portion of the game takes place across roughly two city blocks. You may not think that's much space to cover, but they managed to jam about 30 quests into that space, so it's dense enough to last for 8 to 10 hours of gameplay. That's because not only is the city under siege from the outside, there's also a zombie apocalypse going on inside. The narrow scope and desperate situation lends the whole section a heavy gothic horror vibe, one they really commit to. Strolling through the streets of Alaroth, you'll find haunted houses, cursed plays, uh, which is a Eastwick reference, no less, and even demon-worshipping cultists in bad disguises. They even managed to work in a cursed asylum that's probably the creepiest part of the whole thing. If you're a fan of things like the first half of Bloodborne or Magic the Gathering's Plane of Innistrad, specifically the 2011 version, there's a lot in Flames of Vengeance that you're gonna love here. The main plot is also a dramatic shift from the rest of the game, at least in how it's presented. The prison you need to find is buried somewhere under the city, but it was so far in the past that no one living knows where it is. Except for maybe Belagar, but he seems pretty keen on stopping you for what I feel are obvious reasons. Instead, you have to find the clues hidden throughout the city, and follow them to the end of the trail. So to reiterate, the last ten hours of this game are national treasure in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, while a mad mage periodically drags you to the underworld to rhyme at you. I feel like this whole thing was just tailor-made for me. Once you follow the clues to the tomb where the necromancer lies, Belagar pleads with you to stop. He's been around long enough to remember how the man was when he was alive, and will do just about anything to make sure he stays as dead as he can be. I have no idea if you can choose to let him out here, because the game's made it abundantly clear by this point why that's a bad idea. But that doesn't matter, because Belagar also has a super weapon capable of killing Damien in his back pocket. You take that information and Belagar's agreement to help back to Zandalore and start what in any other game would be the worst part. You're tasked with escorting an airship with the weapon to the main fortress as a dragon. What I think makes this escort quest work better here than in something like Bioshock is two things. The most important thing is you aren't punished for flying ahead and clearing a path. The occasional ballista bolt will make it through, but the ship can tank several hits. The other thing you now have is a nuclear fireball on a 30 second cooldown. It'll wipe most towers and enemies in one hit, and you get it often enough that you should just be firing it off every chance you get. Once the ship progresses far enough, it starts a cutscene where it crashes into the fortress and explodes, sending you and Yagerna back to the Hall of Echoes for a proper showdown. This fight is nowhere nearly as difficult as the memory fight earlier in the game, but it is cathartic after everything this character has put you through. She goes down pretty quickly and the day is saved. The Divine is restored, you fly off into the sunset, and none of this ever gets followed up on barring another Divinity sequel in this continuity. And that's the whole of the thing. You may be wondering why I just spent entirely too many words waxing poetic about a game that did okay and was promptly forgotten by most people. To put it plainly, this game is an important part of one of my favorite developers' history. Divinity 2's development was plagued with issues between the state of the gaming industry 
industry in and after 2008, and publisher pressure. The game was forced out early, so much so that an entire planned area had to be cut for time. And in an interview with Eurogamer.net, Sven Vinka credits the experience of making this game with being the one that made him decide that Larian would make the games they wanted to the way they wanted to. That philosophy carried them through the first Divinity Original Sin game, which proved that not only could they make great turn-based games, but they could also be successful. And the rest is history. While it is only one step, and what I'm sure was a painful one at that, there's an argument to be made that without Divinity 2, we may not have gotten Baldur's Gate 3. Of course, whether it's important or not doesn't really address whether or not it's good, but if you've been paying attention, you already know my answer to that. I love this game. It's a fun romp in an underserved style that's filled to the brim with wit and personality, and I play through it at least every other year or more. But in spite of all of that, I do have trouble recommending it. It's an old game, and like most old games, the Steam version runs terribly on Windows 10. There's a patch you can download that addresses most of the issues, but you can still run into some serious bugs. The reason my character changed after the Ego Draconis part was that the game would just sit in a loading screen forever when it was trying to load the character into the second part. And also I had this interesting issue where an NPC died in a cutscene they weren't supposed to and the game just had no idea how to handle it. The game is available on GOG as well, so that version might run better. I can't speak to that myself for the time being. As a side note, don't pay attention to the time to beat shown on GOG. That also links to the Divinity Original Sin 2 page. Really, the game should last you about 30 hours or so. If this thing looks like your kind of thing, and you have an above average tolerance for jank, there's a ton of fun to be had here. If not, at least you know it exists, and maybe someday we'll get lucky and get a proper follow-up. Anyway, thanks for watching. Be sure to tune in next time when we take a look at a game mere moments before it ceases to be. For now, I hope you had as much fun with this video as I did in making it, and I will catch you in the next one.